Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming this evening. On behalf of myself, thank you. Um, I appreciate you coming out. And uh, I'd like to make a couple notes on drawing. If you're going to endeavor painting light as realistically as you see in the photo or as realistically as you envision it, all of that effort will be undercut immediately if you have errant perspective lines and all of this stuff. Uh, it, it just kind of detracts from that endeavor. So I put in the grueling effort of drawing multiple versions of the same one in advance so that you didn't have to sit here and watch me do that. When it comes to hot press paper, which is the paper that I use, it is so important to not mar the surface of the paper that uh, errant drawing lines and, and the, even one or two wrong guesses and the amount of erasure that it requires, they render it almost impossible to paint the way you might want to. So that's why I am meticulous about measuring things out and, and using a ruler for everything. People ask me, how do you get your lines so straight? I say, a ruler. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not a secret. So you can see that I very faintly painted in the light temperatures that I see in my reference. We're taught often in sort of an academic setting that the approach to light is fairly simple, that your warm light is your yellows, your oranges, your reds, that's what you want to use for sunlight or things that sunlight is hitting. And then your blues, well, that's what you reserve for your shadows. And often, most of the time, that's accurate, but not all the time. Sometimes you'll have a situation in a painting where something is in shadow, but there is a flat surface immediately beneath it. That flat surface reflects light back up onto the object that's casting the shadow. And so you get something of a gradation, and that gradation might look something along these lines. And so you'll get this really simple sort of gradation that goes from the cool blue light to the warmth of reflected light immediately below it. So what I've done is I've started to paint with two pigments that I've found to be especially useful um, in depicting light, a warm yellow and a cool blue. Um, these were pigments that I arrived at after trying for a long time to produce the same gradation that I just did on the back there. For like the first five or six times that I tried all the different blues and yellows that came in my, in my starter pack here, um, they all resulted in green. And well, that's especially not appropriate for what I was trying to convey in terms of light and shadow until I arrived at yellow ochre and French ultramarine, um, both granular pigments. Uh, and later I made a switch to golden ochre instead of yellow ochre because it's a little bit higher key. It's got a warmth to it. Yellow ochre is a little bit more uh, muted, a little bit more neutral in comparison. The, I should note that the golden ochre is a little bit more light fast. So when you're dealing with it, I definitely recommend using like a UV plex instead. And what I noticed being that they are both granular pigments is that I was able to create a mixture of those two that once it dried, didn't turn green. Instead, it read as both yellow and blue combined. And part of that has a lot to do with the fact that I paint on 300 pound hot press. It does this cool granulating thing really, really well. You can lift very, very easily. You can even lift inadvertently. And that happens as well if you're not being careful. But one thing that happens with cold press or rough press or anything with more tooth than this paper is that when your pigment falls out and when it dries, it settles into the tooth of the paper. Whereas on anything that's smooth, like hot press, or in a really exaggerated way, UPO, things tend to fall out the way water and pigment want to. So as you can see, I'm, I'm starting this wash back here. I've got everything that I want covered on the paper covered, for now at least. You know, most academics would never advise just slathering a big streak of black through the whole thing so early in the painting. But I have noted that if you wait to put any dark values or even values in like the three quarters of dark 
and darker side of things, you're gonna run into an issue with simultaneous contrast, um, which is you know, your eye sees that dark and suddenly everything else is much lighter than you intended it to be and you have to paint it all over again. And that's a whole lot of wasted time. So what I like to do is fairly early on in the painting, I like to get punchy quickly. And I like to do so in places that aren't going to put me in a bad way when I try to lay a wash down. So I'm still just using uh, primarily our golden ochre and our French ultramarine on this particular wash over in this corner. I'm gonna use a little bit of sepia. It's a little bit of cheating, but I'm just trying to push that dark value so that I'm making the best decisions with all the information that I possibly can uh, throughout the duration of our time painting here. Now one thing uh, that, I'm, that I'm doing here, I am starting to introduce a little bit of yellow, that warm value towards the bottom here and keeping the, the top uh, darker. Um, in the space, we've got some light that's falling out on the floor here. And that light and any light that's coming through this window, whether reflected or not, is bouncing up and falling out in this direction. So you'll have darker values up top. You can even see it in this panel here where it's a little bit bluer and a little bit warmer as you get towards the bottom. The same could be said for this door here as it's cooler up top and gets progressively warmer towards the bottom. That's just that light reflecting and doing precisely what I was referring to. Um, so that first wash that I had put down before I even started painting, as far as you knew, uh, was just flat values with the exception of this one graded value here on the floor. Um, what I'm gonna start doing now is combinations of the yellow and the blue, the French ultramarine and the golden ochre, and starting to do uh, some of the gradations as well to capture that sense of reflected light. It's always an adventure to pick what wash you're gonna do next if you're working in from the perimeter because you've run out of places to, to put your hand most of the time. Um, I'm gonna shoot for this big middle portion here uh, just so you can see in the reference. There's a bit of a reflected light that comes up directly from the top of the radiator here. As this light comes in through the window and bounces up, it bounces right onto this surface here. There also is sort of a warm passage here that I think is reflected from the floor. And then all of that falls off as it gets closer to the edge of this door here as it works itself into the corner. To do that, I am gonna mix up larger quantities of what I normally use. I have four different sort of sets of values and what it looks like is exclusively the golden ochre, then a, an ochre heavy sort of three quarters ish position between that and the French ultramarine, and then a French ultramarine sort of three quarters or maybe even thirds way between the two, and then one that is more just straight French ultramarine. First thing I'm gonna do is kind of justify to, to this edge over here. I'm painting straight down despite, I don't know if you can see there are little notches for where the bricks are. I'm gonna ignore those and come back for them later. I'm gonna take the next value, the next closest to blue, and just run that down this side here. An important thing to remember with this technique, with anything when you're dealing with trying to get solid granulation, is that keeping a lot of water on the paper is a huge deal. Because there's nothing worse, as I'm sure a handful of you can attest, than trying to put down this super stressful wash and then you, you get so far and you realize, I don't have enough paint to do this and I need to mix up more of the exact same dilutions and, and solutions that I had, except by the time it takes me to finish that, um, now my paint has dried and I've got the choppiest wash you ever did see, and who wants to look at that? So you have to figure out something to hide it with later. Fortunately, in my painting, I've got water stains and bricks and all sorts of extra things to get me out of that trouble, but I try not to uh, rely on that stuff. I try to paint well the first time because there's just nothing like a crisp, clean wash as far as I'm concerned. 
All right, so we got that in there. I'm gonna work on this wash right here. It's just a shadow. Um, it connects with all the other shadows as they do. Uh, but I'd like to get that gradation in there. It's definitely on the warmer side up top as well. And it gets even warmer as we get towards the bottom. Let's see, I'd like to give a note on brushes while I'm talking about materials. Uh, I've been using the same crappy brushes since college. Um, they are whatever the brush equivalent of Threadbare is. They're not in good shape. Uh, and so, I don't know. It's one of those like, if it's not broke, don't, don't fix it. I do treat myself to a new number six every time I finish a full sheet because I, I just absolutely abuse my number six brushes. They're my workhorse. I paint these little tiny lines with them and I paint giant washes that no one has any business painting with a number six brush. But it's all about cohesion. I mean, that's, that's the real reason that I, that I paint uh, with this technique and this way in general is because having a cohesive sense of light is, is just so important to creating a believable space. I'm building up layers to achieve that sort of depth. As you layer these granular pigments, it does tend to have a bit of a, a sort of cumulative effect. You will note that the granulation sort of is enhanced. It, the scale is, is usually not made much larger, like the scale of the granulation, but sometimes it is. So that is something to sort of keep in mind that you don't wanna go, you don't wanna go too nuts with it if you don't want that, that hefty of a granulation. Because scale is important. I mean, sometimes you want a bigger scale of mark making, even if it's granulation in foreground objects as opposed to objects that are further in the background. I wouldn't want them to share the same texture um, at the same scale. I think it would be inappropriate. But I have a whole bunch of other transparent pigments that I use in addition to kind of my, my big six granular pigments. Uh, I would say the big six include the French Ultramarine, the Golden Ochre, the Burnt Sienna, Sepia, Cad Red. Yeah, I think that was it. Five, the big five. Now that's mostly for, you know, that's, that's for the underpainting. Um, but then I take local colors and apply that over top of it. And that's how I get you know, whatever the local color of the thing is. It might be bricks, it might be, um, you know, wood paneling, it might be the, the floor uh, of this particular painting. Having a cohesive palette is also not a, not a bad thing. If, if your work is recognizable because of your palette, that's, again, part of finding your, finding your voice and finding what distinguishes you from, from your contemporaries. Um, I'll continue working on this for a little bit before I bring out the thing that I've developed a little bit more. Initially, when I started painting interiors, it was because I wanted to photograph them. And I saw that I had this giant body of photographs full of really compelling material that was also formally interesting. And under the advisement of some close friends and a professional sort of existential crisis when I, f I found myself painting things that people painted 30 years ago. The 70s, you know? Photorealism was, was like, you know, they were really committed to diners and stuff like that. And while I shared an affinity for those things and my interest in it was honest, I don't think that what I was saying was actually that important for where where we were, you know, historically. But, but you know, it, it caused me to think about what I should be painting and what my voice is. And, and like I said, I, it threw me into a tiny bit of a tailspin and I, you know, really racked my brain for a while about what that meant professionally and was I a sham and, you know, these are the things you think about in undergrad and realize that undergraduates have no business thinking about, you know, thinking of themselves that way, but it is what it is. And, uh, a close friend said, you know, why don't you just like paint something that makes you happy? So I started painting the abandoned interiors. They were interesting, they intrigued me, they were, they were compelling. I think the next thing is the floor and then we'll almost be caught up with my other painting. 
So one more wash down here at the bottom. I am going to introduce a, a different pigment just to speed things up a little bit. And after this one, we'll jump into the next one and we'll start layering local color in as well. You can kind of see there are little dots throughout some of the perspective lines and through some of the bricks and things like that. That's because I, I like to plot everything out in this really kind of maniacally precise way where I take my image in Photoshop and I crop it to the exact dimensions of my support, the piece of paper that I'm working on. And then I bring the rulers up in Photoshop. I slide the sliders to whatever point I'm trying to get to. And then I measure, plot that point, And then I do the corresponding other end of that perspective line. And then I draw the line. And then I do the next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 times two, that's 40 points just to get those floorboards. And it's maddening, but it's right. Um, and, 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 some, and sometimes being right is more important than your sanity. Uh, just working through those gradations there, I'm gonna bring just a tiny little bit of that shadow up on here because we want to be consistent. And with the exception of the radiator and all of the blood, sweat, and tears that that would take, that puts us at uh, a pretty cohesive and well laid out place. Um, I do have some images uh, here that sort of give you an idea of the step-by-step the -step involved in that process, building up those values, building up those layers to the point where we arrive not just at this, but at this. Um, and so that's, that's where, where uh, I'm gonna pick up. So I wanna build up just a tiny bit of value with some uh, you know, gradations in these corners here. And, uh, and then I'd like to set in on, on some uh, local value. Now, you can see in my original image, <laughs> all of the walls are white, which is great for my purposes as a person who's trying to observe light. But what I'm gonna do is instead of leaving that brick wall white, I'm gonna go ahead and layer in uh, some bricks as well so that you can see how we can go very quickly from something that could be closer to a final product to something that looks a little bit more intentional. To do that, I need to very quickly line in the verticals on some bricks. And I'm gonna use this amazing ruler. It's a quilting ruler. At every eighth of an inch, there's another line. They're great for perspective. You can see exactly where the last perspective line is if you overlap and move forward and you can see whether or not your lines are in fact converging rather than diverging when they're supposed to be or not supposed to be. It's just a good way to sort of like check yourself. So with those bricks mapped in, I would like to get a, just a little bit more local value. Some what I would call, I don't know if you'd call this scumbling. It's kind of scumbly. A little bit of precision mixed with a little bit of not precision back here. Right now, in addition to the uh, to the texture provided by the granulation, I'm just sort of fooling around, adding a little bit more, just something a little bit more gestural, something a little bit more painterly, which you know could feel contrived if you're feeling critical, but. Uh, I, I just like, you know, being a little bit more gestural. I like something that has a little bit of, uh, a little bit of energy to it in addition to all the precision. Once you get all that precision laid down, there's opportunity to play fast and loose. I don't think that the time to do that is when you're dealing with perspective lines. Um, you know, some people may do that really well. I am, I am not one of them. I don't trust my, I don't trust my gesture muscles to, to do that well. Taking the brush on its side, and I'm just sort of filling in, but I'm leaving some tall, skinny 
foreshortened shapes on, on the side of the wall. There's a panel of bricks right here that is painted white. I haven't decided if I'm gonna leave it white, but I wanna deal with something important first while it's white because I think it'll be easier for everybody to see if I do. Um, bricks are a pain. There are rarely any way to deal with them that isn't just painting every one of them. One thing that I think is important about bricks in a way that will help you do them quickly is by thinking about depth. You have your initial value, which is just your light temperature as I did it. You have any shadows with any variations in light temperature as I did it here with getting cooler down to getting lighter with the reflected light. That's, you know, step one. But there are also smaller shadows on the surface of the bricks. And what you need to do when you're painting those shadows is consult your reference A and B, be consistent with what you've established in the gradations already. So if I'm gonna make a shadow that's cast by the overhang of the bricks, if the mortar kind of dips in a little bit, we want that to be reflected in the same color that it's immediately next to. So towards the top, I'm gonna want that to be bluer. And as I get closer to the bottom, we're gonna get progressively more yellow. So one thing that's, that's super difficult to see, in my reference here, I can see that those shadows cast by those bricks in the shadowed area on the left here, rather than the really sun bleached area, the shadows themselves are actually warm. And that's in consistency with this uh, spot on the floor that's reflecting back up at them. So I'm gonna run those in real quick, just like I did the last ones. So I would like to take a little bit of time and, and go over you know, some, some local color. I leave my palette a mess, especially with bricks. You, know, you need a whole bunch of different colors and some of them are bluish and I've got that and some of them are purplish and I've got that. Just sort of float that in to those spaces. I'm not being super precise with it. It's not worth it. And it, it tends to be less realistic. Um, if you paint bricks really precisely, they look like, they, they look fake. Start to vary the colors that you're using. Normally, I'll take a couple passes with bricks. I don't, I'm not satisfied after just one. That texture really does need to be built up a little bit. Eventually, I'm gonna have to go in and we'll need a little bit of, you know, black or, or as close to black as that part of the painting has to remain consistent with, with the value scale that we establish. And you know, sometimes that can be like a, a little hole in the brick, sometimes it can be a hole in the mortar. The danger with CAD red when you're dealing with bricks is it, it is very opaque. So that would be one thing to be careful with is if you've, you've put the effort into laying all of this down you know, building up all of this texture and then you start to throw opaque pigments over top of it and just obliterate it. That's not the good kind of settling things in that I was referring to earlier. It's, it's something that I feel like is probably a little bit of a missed opportunity. You can see. And because I haven't yet put any kind of shadows on the mortar in this, I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. And you'll see how much, you don't know, again, how, how easy it is to see here. You know, you've got the local color, you've got your value, you've got your light temperature uh, established there, but that little bit of extra dark value for the ledges in the mortar is what we're shooting for next. So generally with bricks, you know, this is our mortar, these are our bricks. So if, if the light is coming down from the top, then the shadow on the edge of the brick, provided that the mortar is uh, like recessed and not just flat, it's gonna cast a shadow on the top half of the mortar. However, if the light is actually reflected light and is bouncing off the floor and back up, it's gonna be there instead. So I think that I'm gonna do that down here at the bottom and then sort of fade that off as I get towards the top and we'll just see how that goes and hopefully it works well. Works, sounds right in theory, right? As I'm you know, adding these shadows, these lines, these little recesses here and there, um, I'm not doing a solid line. 
I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm varying it. I think that that's important. Yeah, so the bricks, that's, that's the whole, you know, the layering, the use of this as an underpainting. Now, for, for our purposes, because, you know, again, because of the reference and because um, this wall happened to be white and these bricks happened to be painted, it was, it, it could have just been the underpainting and it would have been true to what was in the photo because it was just white. You know, the local color of this was white it, it, despite the, the light temperature. But I, I think that A, for the sake of the demonstration, and B, for the sake of just making the whole composition more interesting, adding those bricks was definitely a, a good option. I'm gonna do, uh, I think, one more quick thing here on the sides. And those shapes that I had made earlier, those sort of plaster scrapes or wallpaper glue or you know what have you, all I'm doing is on the edge of any light shapes, the edge that is on not the light source side, but on the back side, I'm just gonna add a little tiny line of shadow that gives you the sense that it's got a little bit of depth to it. So that we're creating some additional texture on that wall there. I'm in the same mode and have the same really delicate little brush. I'd like to add some detail to this door. That looks like it's definitely seen better days. And those little details definitely help to bring things forward. Um, if you really wanted to get meticulous, you could add a little, little bit of that same shadow that I just did over on this other side to those areas where the paint has chipped. A little bit more intentionality, a little bit more attention to detail, kind of thing that people generally appreciate. Whether it's really needed or not, you know, for your eye to get the, uh, get the gist of it is another question, but it's, you know, it's nice to have. Um, I'm going to mix a pigment that is not any of those ones. And I think that I'm gonna use a little bit of Windsor Blue, and a little tiny bit of Cerulean. The windows here are tremendously dusty and dirty, and there's light coming through them, so anywhere where there's dust or dirt on the window is very light and it kind of falls off before it gets to either of those spots. So we're just gonna work with what's there. The lifting ability, you know, that you have with hot press might be, might be well applied. Cause you can see through the, uh, through the clearer portions of the windows, not through the white areas, you can, you can see buildings. And so, you know, normally if I was painting those, even even sort of lightly to combat the tendency that all of those edges had to be to be really sharp, you know, sharp focus, I would probably go in with the scrubber. I think I may have been a hair aggressive with that blue, but I'm thinking that I'll probably put some black detailing in the window sill, uh, like the window panes that are gonna, are gonna push that because again, that simultaneous contrast it's gonna push it back in the other direction, so I'm not super stressed about it. And I don't think that there's a whole lot of precision. Thank you, everybody.